often called the Switzerland of America, the New England area stands in the minds of many Americans as a delightful resort, far from the cares and routine of their workaday existence. During the winter season, recreationists by the hundreds of thousands are brought by snow trains to join in the informal sport of New England's myriad ski trails and to gain stimulation in the bracing air of her mountains. Not only in winter, but also in summer does New England offer her appeal to vacationists from all parts of America. From June to September, New England's population increases more than one quarter. A host of pleasure seekers journey there every year to enjoy the sophisticated amusements of smart summer colonies. New England today derives about 10% of her yearly income from functioning as a playground for America. Two and a half million summer visitors pay some $525 million each year to enjoy the intimate charm of her landscape and the urbanity which she has imposed upon her rugged surroundings. But to more thoughtful Americans, these six states have a significance deeper than that which they present to recreation seekers. For in New England are the symbols and monuments of the founding fathers, forever meaningful to those who seek a fuller understanding of what America stands for. The pages of New England's history remind all good Americans of the unwavering tenacity of the little band of refugees who more than 300 years ago founded a nation in a strange and hostile world. To our national heritage, these honored dead have brought a quality of courage and endurance that has had a lasting influence on the American character and the American way of life. Conquering this sandy and boulder-strewn soil and the waters which feed upon this rocky coast, men whose aims were founded upon deep religious convictions wrought a new tradition in government, reflecting the stern moral responsibility of their creed. Within the simple dignity of New England's homes has always dwelt a profound and unquenchable yearning for enlightenment. That learned leadership might be assured them, these earnest settlers founded Harvard College in 1636. In 1702, answering the need for another institution of higher education, Yale admitted her first scholars. And as the years passed, many another college arose, such as the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. To this day, New England is still widely known for its schools. For closely woven into the regional fabric of living has always been a hunger for the things of the mind. And part and parcel of the tradition which New England has bequeathed to America is the belief that all governmental decisions must rest upon discussion by enlightened and responsible voters. First, to choose by ballot and plurality vote a town clerk. Second, to choose by ballot and plurality vote one select man for three years. When the break with the mother country came in the year 1775, New England was already experienced in self-government. With this background, it was natural that she should become the cradle of American liberty. Throughout the nation's history, New England has rendered faithful service to the uncompromising ideals upon which she was founded. She has brought forth men who served as the conscience of America and who trod what they considered the paths of righteousness, regardless of the cost to themselves. And from this 300-year-old tradition of plain living and high thinking has stemmed a literature which will ever be one of the greater glories of America. Yet New Englanders have been famed for laying up material treasures. The name of Yankee will always recall the venturesome days of the clipper trade a hundred years ago. It was such enterprise as this which established the United States throughout the world as a ranking commercial power. And today New Englanders still go down to the sea in ships and win a living from it after the manner of their forefathers. Of the seafood that graces America's tables, over half a billion pounds a year come from the same rock-bound coast settled by the founding fathers. In Massachusetts alone, $14 million of the state's annual income is derived from the fishing industry, an important part of which is the lobster trade.
capital of this commonwealth since Puritan times has been Boston, whose golden domed state house stands as a symbol of New England's maritime wealth. When the era of the machine dawned a century ago, the six states of New England soon became America's first great manufacturing region. Provident Yankees utilized funds amassed in trading and seafaring to implement their famous turn for invention and their proverbial hankering to start new enterprises. Thus, the New England of a hundred years ago made for herself a place in the economy of the nation which she has never wholly lost. Of the natural resources which nature had offered her, she made the most through her gift for driving a bargain and her handiness with gadgets. All during the 19th century, New England's fame spread throughout America, throughout the world, as the dwelling place of skillful mechanics and shrewd merchants who made and bartered her manufactured products. And with this prosperity of a hundred years ago, Boston lost much of its Puritan simplicity, as many a merchant and manufacturer reared his stately home on Beacon Hill. Still living behind the old brick fronts and sand lights are a handful of the descendants of Boston's first families. Their fortunes, inherited from the golden age of New England industry, have increased and multiplied through canny reinvestment in the further development of America. From the ranks of these Boston Brahmins, proud of their descent from those who founded the Commonwealth, have developed three centuries of leaders in American thought and political life. Such men as the presidents John Adams and John Quincy Adams. The distinguished historian and critic Henry Adams. Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, celebrated wit and pioneer in medical science. And in our own time, his famous son, the late Justice Holmes of the U.S. Supreme Court. In the minds of many, New England stands first and foremost as a stronghold of the descendants of pilgrims and Puritans. America's early immigrants. Far outnumbering these today are the descendants of later immigrants, the host of the foreign-born who have been pouring into her cities for the past hundred years. In Boston today are some 125,000 Americans of Jewish ancestry, many of whom came here as did the first Americans to enjoy freedom of worship. Here too are more than a quarter million Americans of Irish extraction, contributing their typical warmth and vigor to the national life. Boston has more than 100,000 Americans of Italian descent, colorful and loyal citizens offering their best efforts to the land they have chosen. These two groups, combined with the thousands of French-Canadian ancestry, make Boston one of the great Catholic cities of the world. In Connecticut alone are approximately 200,000 people of Slavonic descent, many of whom have become thrifty and industrious farmers. All these immigrants and many of other nations have contributed their strength and enthusiasm to New England's development, bringing new vitality and achievement to one of the most venerable regions of America. They have transplanted fragments of their old cultures and adapted them to American standards. That you will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That you will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And that you take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, so help you God. A crucial time for New England was the 1920s, when her industries, seeking cheaper labor and more accessible raw materials, began moving away. Once thriving industrial cities became ghost towns, and in the deep depression of the 1930s, nearly a million of the population went on the relief rolls. But then, as always, the New England character faced the future with confidence. Gentlemen, we've still got the industrial plants and the skilled manpower. We've got the railroads and the highways. We've got the Yankee spirit, which has won wars and will lick this depression. At the opening of the fourth decade of this century, America's need to prepare for war once more brought full employment to the New England area and the earliest manufacturing region in the United States played its part in supplying the demands of the largest army the world has ever seen. To solve the problem of clothing the armed forces, of furnishing them with weapons, of transporting them and their equipment to every corner of the earth, New England mustered all the ingenuity of the old-time Yankees, all the forcefulness of her newer people, so that the founding fathers of New England might well have looked with pride on a patriotism that was fully as wholehearted and purposive as had been their own patriotism of centuries past, when they fought to build a new home and a free civilization. And whatever the future may hold, the people of New England can rely upon their qualities of courage and endurance, 
so notably manifested for three centuries to find a solution to New England's problems in tomorrow's world. <laughs>